Thanks for the introduction and welcome everyone to this uh, course module. Uh, just before we start, a little bit about me. Uh, in the top left there, this is uh, me in slightly better days before the COVID-19 hairstyle developed. Uh, my career was really as a surveyor. I worked, worked offshore uh, uh, and overseas, onshore and offshore. Uh, and I've been working with Matthew and the Enveroy team for the last uh, couple of years or so. When I'm not at work or with my family, uh, getting out and about is, is, is my passion. You know, I love getting into the hills and cycling and sports. I play and, and enjoy many sports, so uh, try and be as active as, as possible. Just uh, before we move on, just uh, because uh, of the nature of the career I had, uh, I did have quite a lot of experience of uh, emergencies. Uh, the, the photograph down at the bottom left there is uh, uh, an image I took in a, in a hurricane, basically, when a rig went adrift for four days and was on a collision course with uh, several platforms down the middle of the North Sea uh, between Norway and the UK. So. Uh, I've known what it's like to feel that sort of exposure and uh, that, that you're really depending on luck more than anything else and it's not a nice place to be. So uh, without further ado. So why are we including emergency response or what I'll abbreviate as ER in a set of uh, Inveroy resilience topics? Well, following on from Liz's session, uh, despite all the risk assessments and controls and preparedness, applied by an organization, things can still go wrong. So now I'm going to discuss some elements of an effective ER capability and how they can influence or dictate uh, performance. I know it's an international audience and uh, you, you have backgrounds from several different business sectors. So a little disclaimer, some of this stuff will be UK based, uh, you know, for example, ways of working regulations and some of it will be from maybe higher risk, uh, highly regulated uh, sectors, but hopefully only to discuss the concepts. I'm not going to dwell on details that will not be relevant to all, but I'll just use these as examples. So what is emergency response? My Oxford English Dictionary defines an emergency as a serious and unexpected situation requiring immediate action. Response is defined as an answer or reaction. I think it's quite important to spell that out because the, the, even, in, even in crisis management and uh, incident management documents, terms like incident, accident, event, uh, emergency, crisis, they're used sometimes almost interchangeably. So I think it's quite important just to, uh, just to be clear. Let's just say an emergency is more serious than a localised incident, not as serious as a crisis, but it could escalate to one. Can I just ask you to, in, in your chat box, uh, this is just to try and make it a little bit more interactive, uh, the key aims of emergency response, can you just type in some of your uh, suggestions for what might be key aims? Yeah, some good, some good ideas there. In general terms, I mean, there's many, many, uh, many sources, many documents define this stuff, but a general consensus is these, yeah, some really good ideas coming through from everyone. I don't think we're too far out of line. So some of the consensus items are these, uh, mitigate actual and potential impacts. In other words, avoid making the situation worse deal with it, limit it, and then, then think about recovery. A very important one second here is ensure effective communication and cooperation. Some emergencies can have, by, by their very location or nature, they can have many, many stakeholders. So, so this communication uh, is, is, a, is a key, key element and even becoming more important. And uh, tomorrow, uh, Joanna, one of my colleagues, will, will cover the, the communication aspects of major emergencies and crises and, and uh, 
Uh, I'm not going to uh, overlap with Joanna here. And last but not least, one or, one or two of you mentioned the naval resumption of normal operations. Get back, get back to normal. So these are the aims. So why do we need capabilities for emergency response? Well, if you look at that picture of a collapsed crane, you, 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 I'm sure you get a, a very sudden feel for the need to, to, to be able to rescue the driver of the crane, to stabilize it before it can be righted. There's all sorts of considerations there maybe prompted by that uh, photograph. Several, several needs for uh, us to have emergency response capabilities. Legislation, Liz has mentioned some of it. I won't repeat things, but a lot of the legislation provides simply a framework. It sets out duties. It doesn't really specify what you need to have in your emergency plan or your procedures. It's quite open. Some of it is very prescriptive, uh, like uh, control of major, major hazards, things like that. And civil law, uh, the concept of duty of care. So, so there are various reasons in terms of legislation why we need to, to, to have this under control. Regulations can be just as important or sometimes even more important than law. You know, for example, uh, a company, its, uh, it's regulator gives it a license to operate that can be pivotal to its business performance and success. So regulations as well. Financial, you know, the impact of loss, recovery, uh, disruption. So it can certainly be costs. Uh, a moral driver, uh, a responsible employer, a, a responsible operator, a good neighbor to stakeholders, all these things. And it can simply be good business, you know, in terms of credibility with partners and regulators and competitive advantage. A few other items too. I wouldn't, I wouldn't overdo this list, but you know there are some other things as well, like to, to, to be insurable. You know you might need to you might need to show your capabilities, prove them. So managing risk goes beyond risk assessments and some of the things Liz mentioned. We need to be ready for the adverse events and the abnormal circumstances. So I wouldn't discuss these just now. Uh, I'll briefly just come to each of them in, in turn. These, these are six sort of key elements if you break it down, what a capability looks like. The framework, uh, it's really, yeah, of course, informed by the risks and the realities of your operating environment. So uh, for an office environment, it can be pretty solid state. Maybe, uh, for example, a, a call center uh, the, the main considerations are obviously fire, you know, fire detection systems, you know, medical intervention, first aiders, uh, and, uh, you know, safe evacuation, muster points, things like that. It's quite solid state. For some other major businesses, diverse businesses, uh, they have much more dynamic risks, perhaps. So a lot of organizations, it's, no, it's nothing new, but I just included this little risk matrix here on the right hand side, just as an indication that, you know, we can put a lot of effort into bringing some risks under control. We, we can do an awful lot, but of course we can't prioritize everything. So something else could zoom up to become our most critical risk. And we really need to make sure that, that, that uh, the, the risks and the emergency preparedness and response, that they, they inform each other, they feed off each other. Principles, we need to spell out your principles, and that could be in policies and things like that. Many companies emphasize that in emergency response, they want, they're happy to have a, a prudent overreaction, for example. You know, they're, they're okay with that. They don't want people to, to assume it will all be okay. They want people to, to do what the, the worst case might, might demand them to, to do. Priorities, uh, the, the acronym PEAR, PAIR, is, uh, is used by several companies in several sectors uh, to indicate the priorities in order, being people, environment, assets, and reputation. This is a big help for people in an emergency response scenario, you know, just to be clear in their minds that they shouldn't be worried about, you know, saving, saving assets, you know, saving facilities. 
this should be uh, they should be really focused on people, casualties, evacuation, and then the environment. So pair people, environment, assets, reputation. Your framework may involve facilities. We know. I doubt very much that the call center scenario I mentioned would, would have an emergency room to deal with an emergency, but some some uh, larger companies, uh, integrated companies, they, they may well have emergency response facilities uh, similar to a crisis room, uh, an emergency response room. They may even have an emergency command vehicle, you know, if it's, if it's something outside, you know, for example, the, uh, not a company, but the agencies an emergency command vehicle for uh, scenarios like wildfire or flooding, for example, emergency command boat, for example. And the framework also includes paperwork, of course, key documents, plans, procedures, manuals. Again, a lot of terminology, and it's, uh, it's used sometimes interchangeably, but just to indicate some of that. Documents. Um, for some Small organizations, uh, it's simply, you know, someone who will lead the, if the alarm bell goes, a security presence, a fire warden, a first aider, et cetera, et cetera. Some bigger organizations, they may need to think about tiers, you know, escalating tiers. So emergency teams at the site, so your medical team, you know, your, your, your firefighting team, potentially your rescue team, your search team, things like that. And then in those tiers in the middle there, going up to the local management team, you know, the tactical response, if you like to, to use the bronze, silver and gold uh, terms. And then the support team, that may be your national office, you know, your, your regional presence. And then, of course, if it's a crisis, it can affect your whole, your whole enterprise. So, so, so that's uh, strategic and it's probably located in your... Uh, your HQ or, or the directors who usually work in your HQ, they, they could be anywhere, of course, if, if they're very senior leaders. So some of the key things uh, would be, you know, roles and responsibilities for the key roles in your emergency team. For example, if you're the, uh, if you're the health and safety rep, as an indication, you know, that, the checklists, the guidelines, they are your friend. If the alarm bell goes and you get a call to mobilize at three in the morning on a, maybe a festive weekend, you, you, your head maybe is not going to be totally there. You're not going to be totally ready and able to, to, to function as you might do on a 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning. So, so these checklists are, are very, very important to, to, to think about those kind of worst case, worst timing scenarios. So yeah, I won't go into all the details of documents and things like that, but one of the key things that has to be clear is the, the trigger, you know, the, the notification, you know, who tells the, the, the emergency, the person responsible for the emergency response, who tells them and what do they do to activate support? So, so these things are key and they've got to be documented. I'll move on. Documents for documents sake, you can see in the photo on the left there, they can grow arms and legs. Uh, sometimes it's just easy to put in an appendix to an already large document. Uh, sometimes it's more challenging to, to, to filter it, thin it all back out, get it pointed at your key risks, pointed at your, your current realities. You know, your realities could be simply the same solid state, uh, type activities, but you may have gone into a, a major new contract and maybe it's in a country where you're obliged to work with contractors who are not fully there yet because you, you, you as part of your license to operate, you, uh, you have to work with local contractors who are relatively inexperienced and help them develop. So your role, apart from being the client, is also sometimes the coach. So that can be a very important thing to, to make sure that all that paperwork and, and ways of working is reflecting it. I'm not trying to imply with this image that paper is bad. Uh, what I'm trying to do is say that if, if, if paper is the solution, it's, it's missing the point. It really all has to be about people and practice. So in other words, do we have a process? You know, you know in other words, thinking maybe about the next audit, think about the effectiveness. You know, does the stuff we have help the, the, the 
boys and girls out there at the front line who are most exposed in our activities. So uh, just a, a strong appeal that, you know, just having paper and having vast amounts of paper. I put the sunglasses on there just to give it scale. I think I had to reinforce that desk as well for that, to, for that particular emergency response uh, system. It was adversely impressive. I won't dwell on this, but you can see the difference here. You know, if you have too much stuff, it can become wallpaper, it can become ignored. Uh, if you have a short, sharp message, it's, it's more likely to penetrate and get through and be understood and, and for people to comply. Uh, so people, uh, again, if you, could just, uh, if you could just use your chat function here, just uh, People, rosters, in, in the photograph you can see at the bottom there, in that sort of scenario where there's something major happening, a company has had to convene, you know, various different, you know, representatives from various different departments, teams, functions. Can you just use a chat box to give me some, an indication of some of the roles or, or functions that might be represented in an emergency team? in a large company, in a, in a large incident, a large emergency. Yeah, thanks, some good ones come in there. Uh, yeah, IT computing, thanks Murray. Yes, yeah, someone to handle the media, Joanna, indeed, and uh, medical, yeah, your own, your own chief medical officer, but you certainly need an interface to medical, medical support, even if you don't have medical expertise in-house. Leadership, yeah, finance, finance, a very good one, yeah, someone's come up with a whole barrage there, thanks, Ed. You've got, yeah, I think you've hit most of them in the head there. So I'll close down this chat box now and just, uh, you can split the, the functions into perhaps two groups. You know, the ones that are kind of emergency in the field, you know, the, 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 the operators, you know, engineers, you know, production, security, health and safety, uh, logistics perhaps is more operational. And then the other side of it, complementing that, that focus on the site and the support to the site is, is the, the, the considerations, the wider considerations, communications, external affairs, legal, finance, as some of you mentioned, is, is very important. You know, you need, to, you need to basically have purse strings that can be loosened when this happens. You know, you need to have uh, budget provision for, for these uh, scenarios. HR, very important as well for dealing with next of kin and things like that. So moving on, people, thanks for your inputs. I'm not gonna to spend too long on this because I, I could actually spend all day on this stuff. And, and I mentioned that uh, communication will be covered by Joanna tomorrow. This stuff is becoming increasingly important. Uh, just the, the, the scrutiny that the businesses, the scrutiny we're all under in, 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 in this, uh, in, with social media, with you know the amount of kind of judgment, opinion floating about out there, we have to be very streetwise here. It's becoming increasingly important that we uh, that, that we're joined up uh, with information and communications and uh, and technology. Just I'm not going to dwell on too many of this, these things. Uh, this little gizmo here on the on the right hand side, it's about the size of a coffee coffee flask. And it's, uh, it was initially developed in France to, to throw into the water in the event that a, a, a trawlerman, a French trawler, trawling crew member, had fallen into the water. Because the very nature of fishing is that vessels can't just cut the trawling gear and, and go and rescue the, the, the person in the water. They have to basically be able to turn around. So, so, you know, this was seen as an aid to being able to go back and recover a man overboard. However, this little beautiful and elegant piece of technology is also 
by its characteristics, you know, of sitting low in the water, it, it's invaluable for things like uh, oil spills or other sectors like shipping or ferries. If they have a, if they have a suspected man overboard, uh, missing person, uh, it's very useful. It's got a satellite pinger and uh, you can basically be directed to back to, to, to where that, that uh, tracking boy is. And if, if you work in a oil and gas scenario, uh, a lot of oil spills that do happen, they sometimes tend to happen just before hours of darkness. So you can't actually sometimes physically monitor, yes, you can use satellite imaging, but you can't physically monitor uh, where the oil spill is going. So, so, so this, this type of technology is really simple and highly effective. Coming back to the list, uh, single points of failure. You don't want to be over dependent on your phone networks. You might need backups like uh, satellite phones, radios, long distance radios. You need to be aware of where you're exposed there by, by being over dependent. These things have to be owned. This is sometimes missed. You know, pe people think, oh, great, we've got a new bit of technology. Who's going to make sure the battery is fully charged so it's ready to go at all times? These are the little sort of house uh, housekeeping rules that, that can sometimes stymie the, 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 the harnessing the benefits of technology. So ownership and responsibilities are very, very important. And on the last one there, situational awareness, I'll just show, this is, sorry, this is a very fuzzy image here. It's basically a, a multimedia uh, display, a very interactive display. This is an example, it, it combines obviously overview, you know, what is, and that's not just your fixed assets like your, you know, the pipelines and rigs and platforms, that's uh, the dynamic stuff, you know, where are the vessel, where are the helicopters perhaps that have been deployed to recover people. Uh, it's interactive multimedia, so you can have your, your actions, your actions list there. And uh, and your stakeholders list, for example, you can have your priorities. So it's uh, it's very very useful to have this sort of integration and overview. It doesn't have to be on this scale for any a smaller enterprise, of course, but it would certainly help if they had you know photos and video seen of the accident. It will help them to readily understand it and and what they need to do. So uh, the terminology is situational awareness, and, and this this particular concept is is uh, is called uh, often called the common operating picture. You know, a kind of central window into into all your activities, and uh, and it's uh, it's part of a an emergency response system which is called the incident command system, which is used for major multi agency incidents like uh, flooding and uh, and wildfires, things like that. Moving on, uh, practice is also very important. You can get practice, of course, through call-outs. You know, you have real emergencies, but if you don't have those, it's a very good thing. You know, you're controlling, you're controlling hazards. You, you have you have prevention firmly in place. But even though you never want to be too over dependent on that, we really need to practice proactively, it's not like the word proactively, but you've got to think, hmm, okay, we're not having many call outs, but are we still ready to respond? I think a good analogy here is, uh, uh, I have a driving license, I passed my driving test when I was 17. That license doesn't mean I could pass my driving test tomorrow. It's quite different. Practice and competence are, uh, are not sheep dipping, they're not just one off things. So in, in, in practice, just a few things to consider. The scope and the type of your training, uh, you know, is it going to be a tabletop exercise? Is, is it simply an organization, you know, doing an evacuation drill and going out to the muster point and doing a head count? If it's a major exercise, is it tabletop or is it live? You know, are you, are you going to actually de deploy resources uh, and how many tiers of your organization is it going to uh, affect? Are you going to just do it between the site and the office or are you going to go up to headquarters to test the communication and, and the procedures? The scenario, very important that it's credible. 
uh, and it, it tests the team. It's not easy. It's, it's something which is challenging uh, and based on your risks. Exercise control document. Basically, you, you want a terms of reference. You want something to specify rules, the timings, and the inputs. You know, the role players that may be uh, pretending to be the media or next of kin or, or, or the unseen commander at the site of the emergency, for example. The timing of your practice. This is very important too. You want it to be convenient, you know. 2 p.m. On a, on, a, on a Wednesday, or do you want it to be realistic? No, midnight on a, on a, on a Saturday. Do you want it to, to have notice? Do you want no notice? What, 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 uh, these are some of the things to think about on timing. They may not feel like it by the people involved. They can feel under test. Really what you're doing is testing their framework, your emergency response framework. You're testing how it joins up, you're testing how it uh, helps people in decision making, how it helps overview. It's not, people feel often under test, but it's not about people being tested and it's an exam type thing, pass fail. Stakeholders, some companies, when they feel that they have a competent system, you know, uh, you know well rehearsed, they're, they're happy to, to invite stakeholders. So, their venture partners or their regulators, even NGOs, is, is quite good, I think, in principle to have stakeholder. A clear start and a close out, this is, this is important as well because uh, my, I know from personal experience uh, in an office, a 17 story office, they did a, a test of the local fire, uh, emergency services, fire service, and the nature of the test was a, 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 bomb, a bomb scare a bomb alert. So the local fire services came into the office, they found this dummy bomb and uh, people could come back to the office. People who'd been ev evacuated when the alarm went, that they could come back into the office. No sooner when we were back at the office than uh, the alarm went again because the people who'd run the exercise forgot to take the box with the wires back out of the building. So the next person into that meeting room immediately raised the alarm. They saw this bomb in the office. So you need to make sure that these exercises are closed out, uh, clear start and, and close out. A status matrix, you need to keep track really of your exercises and your call outs, you know, who is involved, you know, what sort of level of refresher training might they need. Uh, uh, this is important stuff as well. The two images down at the bottom there, well, the top image is a typical medium-sized company emergency room with those the situational awareness uh, displays video conferencing etc as well on the wall there down at the bottom that's another type of practice getting to a specific hazard in this case the offshore industry you know people have to practice uh, the scenario of a, of a helicopter uh, landing in the water and possibly capsizing in the water and that's, uh, that's pretty serious uh, uh, practical, physical training to try and muscle memory. Learning. <clears throat> when we do call-outs and exercises, we, there's no point in doing them if we don't review them. Otherwise, you risk uh, having a situation of kind of all heat and no light. Get feedback from all involved, you know, not just the people in the room where the, where the team uh, mainly uh, 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 gathered. Update your framework as required, you know, not, not just with lessons learned, it's all very well collecting lessons learned, but what do they mean? What, what changes need to be made? So, so as required is important and not just saying, oh, well, we'll review every three years. That, that may not be good enough. The records, uh, all, all records relating to the emergency response, they're retained and secure. They may be vital for things like uh, incident investigation or, uh, or uh, legal proceedings, for example. And learning, sometimes I think, many times we're, we're, we miss opportunities to learn. We, we, we forget that people have, they can have unique perspectives. You know, a major contractor can work with several clients. So does the client take time to ask the main contractor how the client compares with their competitors. So sometimes I think we miss the chance to harness that feedback, you know, that benchmarking, if you like, from clients, contractors, regulators, 
and even consultants as well, because they see a lot of operators. And best practice, I mentioned uh, the, the, the fishing, the fishing uh, tracking buoy for man overboard uh, used in, uh, in the oil and gas industry. So best practice may not be in your industry. Keep, keep, keep looking across the fence. Culture, it's a word we hear a lot about nowadays, but uh, and tomorrow uh, Dick is going to do a session on scanning. The first item here is not really about that uh, so much as, you know, just having this constant feeling of what else, you know, what, what maybe I've missed, you know, what, what, what's changing, and just having that sort of uh, consideration of, you know, we've, we've done a good job here, we've done homework, but what, what may we have missed? It's just having that sort of sense of uh, unease, if you like. The picture there of a, of a refugee boat in, in trouble, I think, is obviously listing considerably. Many shipping companies and ferry companies and you know offshore activities in several parts of the world, they, they really must consider the, the, the possibility of interacting with a refugee vessel. You know, so what is what is their frame of reference? You know, is it the law of the sea? Is it the the UN uh, High Commissioner for Refugees, you know, where do they get the guidance to tell them what to do? But again, it's just having that sense of unease, you know, what else could happen? Management style, you know, some management teams don't like the chaos and uncertainty of ER because they can't control it, you know, it's not, uh, it's not something that they, they can make sense of. Uh, and some love it. Some managers love wading in and showing that they're, they're flexing their experience and showing that they can still do it. So culture can vary there. Management style does set an important uh, blueprint. Is emergency response integral or is it competing with core jobs? It's, uh, it's, it's sad to be people going to the emergency room to do a drill or exercise and then it's almost like a necessary evil, you know, it's like, oh, here we go again. Uh, and that's, I think, because they're under pressure. It's, it's interfering, com competing with the core jobs, you know, the, the parameters in which their, their, their performance will be assessed. So it's got to be combined. And uh, do they champion ER? Do, do they observe? Do they take part? I think the analogy there maybe from football is you don't want your leadership team to be the referees, but you, you don't mind them being the goalkeeper, you know, part of the team, but mainly watching the team in action. So, yeah, just that sense of uh, radar scanning, you know, just uh, what else, you know, just being aware of your sphere of influence, you know, what else could happen, you know, where else are we exposed? Uh, these are two images of the same project, same key side, same crane, and it's the one operation, same project, but there are very different standards and controls. The lorry you can see on the left hand side there, reversed right up to the edge of the jetty, no one checking how far it should come back. Conversely, on the, on the vessel, you know, toolbox talk, taglines, no one under the suspended load, uh, carefully controlled. Uh, totally different standards, but yeah, it's the same operation. Impact of poor ER, if you can just, this is my, I think my, uh, just a couple more slides, or I can just ask you to use the chat box again, just to bash in. If companies don't have, you know, sufficient or suitable emergency response capabilities, you know, what, what are some of the impacts that uh, that can uh, affect them. Just, just type in some of the things where it can go wrong. Business impacts of poor emergency response. Oh, I can't actually see the text box, sorry. I'll just, uh, in a word, loss, basically loss of, loss of people, loss of life. Uh, penalties, fines, production loss, the impacts can be considerable. Strong capabilities, I'll just quickly run through this, just processing people again, uh, two sides of the same coin really, but a, a structured approach, you know, a system that's maintained and improved, 
the next provision, you know, next emergency budget available, it can short circuit admin like purchase orders. When an email will be enough to get a, a helicopter launched to, uh, to, to, to assist, for example. Stakeholder involvement, overview, testing and plans. Uh, people, people need to be streetwise, you know, uh, responding to emergencies. If you're not streetwise, you can, you can go very quickly from responding to the emergency at the site to responding, if you like, responding to the response, you know, because the media has taken hold of the story and suddenly your problem's not at the site anymore. It's more about managing this uh, response to it. Uh, so, so we need to be very careful there. Sense of unease, I mentioned, you know, this idea of one, one operation, leadership engagement, and, uh, and yeah, emergency response activity, not, not interfering with your so-called day job. It's in your job description, and you're appraised on your, your undertaking in that role on the emergency team. I think this is very, very important. Stuart uh, mentioned it yesterday when talking about crisis management, and I fully agree. A culture of learning and improving. So response is really, you don't want to be, you don't want to be doing emergency response all the time. Of course, you're, you're trying to prevent and be prepared, but response is just one of these four steps. It's the second last one. Obviously recovery is, is very important as well. And, and emergency response has to transition very seamlessly into recovery and provisions for trying to resume operations. So in a nutshell, if we're good at emergency response, it is more likely that we're good at managing our business and our operations, and it is more likely that we'll be able to cope with crisis. Last slide is about uh, COVID. I'm not going to go into this because Liz already mentioned some of this stuff, but uh, the virtual basis there, the, the, the third last uh, bullet, you know, the companies that have this, these emergency capabilities, you know, have they tested them in this uh, in this environment of virtual working? Uh, that's uh, that's an important consideration. So, in the interest of time, I'll I'll stop there so we get time for some questions. But uh, but that that information and those websites will be in the information that's shared. So. Yeah, just any questions, please. John, thanks, thanks very much indeed for, for your, your presentation there, 40 minutes of, of high value stuff. Um, in particular, love the fact that it links the, the health and safety piece, that it all starts with the risk assessment and what we can do with mitigating and uh, reducing the, the likelihood or probability and reducing the impact, your, your, your um, box that you showed uh, and linking it to risks. Um, plans have to be sh short enough that they cover what they cover and trainable and in particular you, you and I've traveled around the world delivering this and you know, that idea of not everyone's first language is English and therefore it has to be understandable to someone whose second language is English you know no highfalutin complicated words make the maximum use of checklists and diagrams keep it to about as you said there about 85 pages uh, if anyone has got any further questions um, then please do do type them up. But I've got one from, uh, if I scroll back to 1119 from Alex, uh, who writes, uh, it, it is important for combined emergency response plans to be tested in office buildings with different companies on the premise. Uh, as part of stakeholder engagement, this is sometimes overlooked and information exchange can be lost under review. Reviews can be focused on the individual company other than the combined what is your thoughts on this? And you know, that classic of a big office building and you've got one floor, uh, how, does, how do you combine that fire response, for example? Yeah, Alex, that's a, that's a very good one. Uh, and that is, uh, that is one thing that's covered in the legislation. That surprisingly is one case where people who share premises, that they have to cooperate uh, and can't all be you know, leaving gaps and overlaps. So if I could, maybe I'll capture that question, Alex, and I'll maybe reply by email because there are a few specific things I can uh, advise or, or ask you to consider there. So okay. if, if we can just keep a record of that chat, David, I can reply to Alex on this, but 
there's some useful stuff and yeah it's a very good question yeah and certainly Sorry, Alex, i'm not trying to fob you off <laughs> no not a pull and that's the point of why we've got the emails and so on to be able to do that but we've certainly done exercises um where you then realize that three companies are using the same uh, muster point and suddenly instead of having just 50 people there you've got 500 people there and the muster point just isn't big enough for example so so absolutely right um yeah, and uh and alex thanks for the question um uh, aaron's just written uh yeah i've worked with several local councils who in the middle of a crisis only then decide what their priorities are how do we address this culture as it seems to be endemic in the public sector uh, again, John, if you've got any thoughts on, on public sector and, and the concerns there? Yeah, I have really very little experience actually in the public sector, but, but uh, I have heard this from uh, a cousin of mine who works in a, a, a county council, uh, similar things to what Aaron uh, mentions there. Yeah, I, th I think uh, I use the word culture. I think, I think there has to be a bit of a culture change in terms of... Uh, just leaving it to the day. I think the analogy is like, a, you know, football teams, uh, football teams, uh, they train extensively uh, and it's all about match day, really. So if, if it sounds as if, to paraphrase what Aaron's saying, the councils are focused only on match day, but, but, but not on the training. They need to be match, match fit and match ready. So it's, uh, again, if I can maybe reply to that with some specific sort of, uh, things to factor in there to try and try and change minds and get people thinking more about uh, preparedness rather than response yeah and i can see some comments coming in there from mike and from john so so thank you for there uh, and it each organization in that in that public sector world i'm sure will be different but trying to get the conversation with them beforehand so that it is clear uh, that you know nine times out of ten hopefully ten times out of ten people will be the top priority um, but then what? And uh, something that, that may be of use to people uh, who haven't heard it before is the concept of main effort and trying to get the organisations to decide amongst all your competing priorities, what is it that if there's a competitive, com put my teeth in, um, competing requirement for resources, uh, what is it that is going to take priority? Is it um you know putting out the fire is it the casualties moving to hospital that are, so uh so a thought and perhaps one that we can address later i'm conscious that time is is up uh and that yeah you know, we're Ma 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 matthew uh yeah just important i think there's some good comments there and john john has mentioned that he disagrees with the comment of the local councils that that's not in his experience so uh yeah, apologies. I don't want to give the impression that was. Uh, it's not meant to be a generalisation, but, uh, but clearly John doesn't doesn't recognise that 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 uh, view on councils and public. Space. Yep, no, and that's, that's expected. Everyone's going to be different. So uh, I'd just like to finish. Uh, I mentioned at the start the uh, the Erskine um, caring for veterans, uh, close to my heart. Uh, and, and Embroy based in here in Scotland. If you've appreciated what we've done today and feel that you're able to, we'd be delighted if you can contribute to our Just Giving uh, efforts. If not, fully understood, it is, it is entirely voluntary, but thank you very much for your time today. Uh, if you are able to join us again tomorrow, uh, we have Joanna talking about crisis communications and, and some things to consider uh, with her um, uh, partner in crime, Bonnie, who I think have both been on the call today. And uh, our last session will be with Dick Hewitt looking at how do we bounce back better uh, afterwards so that we, we learn from the experience and we embed what we learn rather than just leave it to chance. And I think the phrase that Dick uses is we want to avoid snap back so that people revert to their, the, the concept that they revert back to what we did before. No, no, we don't want to go back to what we did before. We want to enhance and learn those lessons as uh, Mike commented by learning the lessons rather than just identifying them, we will be better placed for, for whatever next. But thank you for today. Thank you for your time and uh, look forward to seeing you all tomorrow.